I want to take, I want to walk you through a process that I actually went through this week because Monday morning I was sitting talking to my wife. Now I believe the Bible is 100% true. I believe God is 100% real, but I woke up Monday morning and this thought ran across my mind. What if we're wrong? That's exactly what it is. It's a lie, isn't it? And Satan uses that stuff, doesn't he? He just plants those little thoughts and seeds. You're not good enough. What if you're wrong? I know I'm not wrong. I, 100%. I know that. I know this is not wrong. I believe that. But I'm human. Right? So are you. Sometimes you wonder. I just wonder, does God see me? So we're going to spend, I'm going to lead you through this process. This is exactly what I did to encourage myself in the Lord from the book. The first thing I did was kept my nose in the book. There's a book called Lamentations. It's in the Old Testament. Okay, go ahead. Try to find it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Actually, I put it up here because by the time I'm done reading, you you will still you'll be in Genesis somewhere. Okay. So this this book of Lamentations was written by who I believe was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was lamenting. He was sad over the fact um, he was sad over the fact that Jerusalem had been destroyed. Everything was taken from him. He was wondering whether God was faithful. And um, thank you. And he was wondering, man, God, how can I ever, how can I ever see you differently? And how and is it ever going to be different? Have you ever asked yourself that question in life? Are my circumstances ever going to be different? Why, why, God, do you have me going through this? This is kind of what Jeremiah was talking about when he wrote Lamentations. Chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Now, they ruined Jerusalem. They overtook Jerusalem. They, all the people were um, homeless. Uh, they were supposed to believe in God, but they were left homeless. They were, they were struggling. They were discouraged. And, and these words were written by the prophet Jeremiah in relation to a circumstance that where it appeared, God was not even present. How, God, could you allow Jerusalem to be destroyed? Jerusalem of all places. Let's read this together. And this whole thing is titled, this whole thing is uh, titled, God is Faithful in Every Circumstance. That's the title of this whole idea. And I was thinking about this this week, and this is what I did to kind of encourage myself through this. So let's read together. Lamentations chapter 3, 19 through 26. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation from the Lord. Have you ever been in a circumstance and you're wondering when God's going to answer your prayer? You're wondering, you're just wondering. Man, if God is so great, he's so good, and he's so able, could he see me and could he fix what I'm going through? Could he fix with what I'm struggling with? Obviously, we know the answer to that, but we're human. Therefore, we struggle and we forget. We forget that God is faithful. He's a faithful, faithful God. What is faithful? What is faith? Confidence, belief, trust, reliance. So when I say God is a faithful God, you can 
have confidence in God, you can believe in God, you can trust God, and you can rely on Him. He will come through. Now, all that being said, He may not come through the way you want Him to. <laughs> you know how that is. Yeah, but God, I wanted C, and you gave me D. Yeah, there's not much you can do about that, right? And we have to see Him in His character and how faithful He can be to us. Jeremiah went through this very same thing, and oftentimes we find ourselves in situations that are affected by situations in varying degrees that we don't understand. We just don't understand it. And it seems like you're going through life, and the tables are automatically turned over. Have you ever been in a situation like that? And you're like, wait. I go to church every Sunday. Why are you doing this to me? I serve at Rives every Sunday. Why are you doing this to me? I'm focusing on you. I'm reading your word. Why are you doing this to me? The fact of the matter is, God uses things. That doesn't mean he's not trying to teach you something. And sometimes those lessons can be a little painful. You know what I mean? They can be painful. You may ask yourself this question. God, why me? Why did you choose me out of all these people? Everybody else. Th think about Jeff and Mary, okay? Jeff, stage four cancer, right? Stage four cancer. And I have, I have not heard Jeff say this, which is a testimony. Like, I, I've, I've been listening and watching him. He has not said, I just don't understand, God, why? I have not heard Jeff say that. What he has said is this, is this has to be a blessing from the Lord. Stage four cancer? What? Are you kidding me? And we squabble, at least I squabble, when they only put one Splenda in my drink instead of three. Think about this for a second. We lose sight of things, and we lose sight of a faithful God and what he wants to do and what he's trying to do in us because we have these questions. I just don't understand. Does God even love me? Does he even see me? Number two, I mean, does he see me? Why is he doing this to me, right? Some of you may be asking the question, God must be punishing me for what I did years ago. Not true. Not true. Have you ever thought this? I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and I just wish he, wish he would show me something. Show me something. Or maybe even something like this if you want to put a spiritual spin to it. God, look at us. We're doing your work. Why are you allowing this? Lord, we're pointing people to your word. Can't you see what we're doing here? Do you see what we're doing here? How about all those Bibles we're giving away, which I love doing, and that's a good thing. God, don't you see that we're doing that? And in our humanity and in my humanity, I'm like expecting an answer. Like I deserve an answer, number one. I don't. None of us do. But like, like, the God of the universe has to give me an answer. Think about this. He doesn't have to answer your God, why me? He doesn't have to answer that. But let me lead you through this, and this is something that, that helps me. I, and, and the more I talk, the more you're going to realize, ooh, that, that preacher is really, really human. <laughs> because many times I have to purposefully tell myself, JP, you need to change your thinking. You need to change what you're thinking about and how you're thinking. Look at verses 19 and 20. Don't be consumed by your thoughts. Don't be consumed by your thoughts. Listen, the battle, the battle that we're in, okay, it's not a battle against flesh and blood. It's a battle against principalities and power. And what Satan uses, the world uses, and your flesh will use is this thing between your ears. 
and he'll get you sidetracked. He did it with Eve. You actually believe that if you bite the apple that you're going to be like God? Come on. It's no big deal. Take a bite. One bite. Thank you, Adam and Eve. <laughs> you know, deceived, right? We get deceived in our minds and we believe things that aren't true. And that's why we have to go back to the word of God and learn about his character and understand that he's completely faithful all the time. Don't be consumed by your thoughts. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve my loss. Now, in the King James Version where it says bitter, there's a word for that and it's called gall. Gall. And that means it's like icky, bitter, icky. You know, like um, you bite into something, you're like, ugh. What in the world was that? Like you can't hardly stand it. The thought of what was going on in the prophet's head and was going on in Jerusalem, he was so focused on his suffering and so focused on the fact that he felt hopeless that it was bitter to him. And he had a hard time forgetting. I could stop right there and talk for six hours about that. How many of you have ever been through something traumatic, and you have a hard time forgetting. Okay, so two, thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Come on. Everyone in this room. Everyone in this room. Don't play. We're not, don't get it twisted. Everyone struggles with this. Man, I just can't get that out of my head. And what that will do to you if you stay there is you will end up getting bitter just like the prophet. The thoughts that I'm homeless, the thoughts that I've been through suffering make me bitter, not better, bitter. Think about, think about the man in the Bible. He's somewhat familiar to most. His name was Job. Job chapter 30, verses 26 through 28. So I look for good. Tell me if this doesn't ring true with you. So I look for good, but evil came instead. I waited for light. Darkness fell. My heart was troubled and restless. Days of suffering torment me. I walk in gloom without sunlight. I stand in the public square and cry for help. As long as we continue to contemplate and ruminate on our troubles, the more we will become convinced that we are isolated, God doesn't see us, nor does God hear us. And then we travel down a path that is not so good. And we call that many times the path of depression. You get depressed, go into this depressive state, not being able to see things from God's perspective. But when we focus on the Lord, we're finally able to rise above those thoughts somehow. And rather than suffer, suffer under trouble, we thank God for them and live above them. It's possible. It's not easy, but it's possible. Another thing that I have to tell, tell myself, not just be, don't be consumed by my thoughts, but I need to change my thinking. Uh, if I had a dollar for every time I said this, I would be extremely wealthy, which I am not. You have to change how you think. You can control your thoughts. You have the Spirit of God living in you with the power of the resurrection behind you. You can change your thoughts. Now, if you want to erase this and not even talk about this, it's scientifically proven that you can create new neural pathways to think differently. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. 
What does it say? Anybody. But by the, come on. What Say who over here? Say it again. The what? The renewing of your mind. How do you do that? That means we, our minds get old. We get stinking thinking going on, right? And we, and we attach ourselves to those bad things. That was what was happening right here. And we have to renew our minds. Renew our minds. Why? Because we're broken, fallen people. That's why we're broken and fallen. Look at verses 21 through 24. Right after he said he was grieving over his loss, Jeremiah said these words. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. If you look at a circumstance and try to find solutions outside of what God can provide, you will end up hopeless. You'll be spinning in a circle, chasing your tail, or in the hamster wheel, as I call it. Going 100 miles an hour and going nowhere. We have to change how we think. I have to change how I think. How do I do that? We're going to get to that in a second. When we focus on what is true, when we focus on what is true, it changes our thinking. I've said this verse before, John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy word because thy word is truth. You have to change your thinking. How? By putting different information in your brain. This is kind of practical here. I have to do this. I had to do this this week. Man, I was struggling. I'll be honest with you. Man, Lord, I... What, What's going on? I, you know, some things I was thinking about and just trying to get a, get ahead of it, and I couldn't. And then it dawned on me, really weirdly, hey JP, get your nose in the book. I was like, okay, yeah, it's a great idea. Maybe I should do that. You have to remember these things, though. And I did this. I went through and read all these things. God was faithful when the Israelites were standing at the Red Sea with death on their heels. They made it out alive because he divided the Red Sea. Not not a small thing. I also think God was faithful to protect them from themselves when he placed them in the desert wilderness for 40 years. Yeah, but God, I'm suffering but I know what's best for you. You need to be in the sand for 40 years. While they were in the desert, God was faithful to feed them with manna and birds and give them water to drink. God's not faithful? Come on now. God was faithful to Noah and his family when the waters were rising. You know, Noah and the flood. And think about this. 40 days with your family and all your pets. Are you kidding me? Some of us don't want to spend four minutes with our family. 40 days. God was faithful to Joseph with the coat of many colors when he was thrown into the well by his brothers. Had he not been thrown into the well. He would have not become the highest ranking official under Pharaoh in Egypt. God was faithful even in a suffering of throwing someone in a well. God was faithful to David when he pulled stones out of the brook that ultimately killed Goliath and gave Israel the victory, showing him that he was faithful. Amen? 
He was faithful when he used the talking donkey to communicate to Balaam. I almost said it. I almost said it. Caught myself. He wanted to get Balaam's attention, so he used a stubborn mule to communicate. And sometimes I think he even uses me occasionally. Isn't that interesting? God was faithful to Elijah, and he answered the prayers when he came down and consumed the 300 and some odd prophets of Baal who were mocking him. God was faithful to Daniel when he was in the lion's den. And you don't think he sees you? God was faithful to Job when he took everything he had. And after it was all said and done, he gave him back double. Don't tell me God's not faithful. God was faithful to feed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves. What? There's nothing worse than running out of food at a church function. Right? And there were leftovers. Don't tell me God's not faithful. In the little stuff. God was faithful to Lazarus. Lazarus was a good friend to Jesus, actually. He raised Lazarus from the dead. God was faithful to the disciples, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. He was faithful to them. God was faithful to Paul, Timothy, and Titus. Think about Paul. Shipwrecked, beaten, stoned almost to death, without food, without clothing, without shelter. Paul says, he's my sufficiency. Are you kidding me? And most of all, God was faithful to raise Jesus from the dead. You ought to be thankful for that. God has been faithful to you and me. And I'm telling you, he's not going to stop being faithful, and he's going to be faithful in every single circumstance. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It may be painful. That loss may hurt. But God will ever remain faithful. You can trust Him. You can have confidence in Him. You can believe Him. You can rely on Him. Let me read some verses for you. Psalm 77. But then I recall all that you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds long ago. Let's look at this one. Thy mercies, O Lord, in the heavens, thy faithfulness unto the clouds. Have you ever looked up in the sky? You ever been out west and you can, far as you can see, far as you can see, it goes further than you can see. That doesn't even begin to describe the faithfulness of God. Let's look at this other verse. This is true. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion. You're going through something that you're struggling with. I think of Jeff and Mary. I think a lot of you. You're going through something where you think, I do not know what the answer is, and I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. God is your portion. He's your portion. Look at this next verse. This is the hard part. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Man, I'm going to tell you what right now. There are things that come along. I don't feel very brave and courageous. I feel like a little sissy that wants to run and hide. But then I'm reminded that if God is for me, there's nothing that man can do to me. Period. 
We got to stop whimpering around like a bunch of little weak mouth, milk toast sissies. We serve a God who's great. He's good. He's faithful. Amen. One of the things that we have to do is to rest in God. Rest in God. Look at these verses up here. The Lord is good to those who depend on Him. That word depend actually means to relax. To relax on Him, to those who search for Him. So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation from the Lord. How many times have we gone through circumstances and we don't wait quietly and we're not patient and we try to figure it out ourselves and the only thing we do is make it worse? Amen. You try and you try and you try and you just make it worse. Until we recognize that God actually wants to enter into that. He wants us to have faith, trust, confidence, belief, reliance in him. He wants us to depend on what he can do, not what we think we can do. That's where it gets messed up. The writer here, uh, Jeremiah, says these words. So it's good for you to sit down and shut up and don't try to fix it. Just wait patiently on God. Enjoy Him. If you're like me, my OCD control freak nature comes out and I just about lose my mind because I'm like, ah, I can't. I was fixing, fixing something the other day at the house, and Sue was helping me, and we had to let it set for a minute before it was ready. And so we waited for like two or three minutes, and I ran in real quick. She's like, where are you going? We have to wait. She goes, why can't you wait? And I turned around, and sure, you can ask her. As sure as I'm standing here, I said, because I'm an impatient person, and I don't want to wait. I want to get it fixed. So I can do the next thing, right? And it was plumbing stuff. I finally got it fixed. Here's the funny part. Got it all fixed, rushed up. And, Babe, turn on the water. Oh. She turned it on. I'm upstairs. She's in the basement. I'm screaming, shut the water off. Had I waited patiently for the solder joint to cool, it would not have leaked. So you know what I had to do? It, it And you wonder why God makes us go back and do things again. Sometimes you got to redo it to learn the lesson. Amen? He just wants us to cling to him and do it his way. And I'll be honest, my wife was right. You won't ever hear that again. No, you will. She was right. I was impatient. And, and I, by the way, I got the leak fixed. I, I took care of it. Uh, where is he? At? I, yeah, I got the leak fixed. Thank you. We have a plumber. He said, I'll help you. I'm like, no, I think I can do this. I finally figured it out, and it's good now. So, um, But isn't, isn't that how God is sometimes? Try to do it our way. And life leaks all over the place. It's just stuff. We can't keep it in. And sometimes you need just to sit down like I should have sat down and let the pipe cool off first so it would be ready. That's hard for us as humans, isn't it? What does that mean? In the middle of the thing that we're going through, maybe we just need to rest in God and that's it. That can be hard. Look at this, Micah chapter 7, verse 7. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Psalm 130, verse 5, and I'll end with this. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on Him. I have put my hope in His Word. What are you counting on today? What are you relying on? When things are good, Jesus. 
How about when things are bad? I'm tempted to fix it. I can't pray no more. I've done prayed all the prayers. I don't know what else to say. Do you even hear me? Come on. Hello? Have you ever done that? Okay, so none of you are like me. You do it inside. I know. I know. And you know what I hear back? This really small voice that says, JP, be quiet and sit down. That's what I hear. And I'm like, okay, Lord, you're right. Here's what I'm confident of. I believe 100% that God is faithful, loving, and kind. I believe that he loves us and he cares for us. I believe it was not his desire for us to go through these hardships. However, but because of sin, he sent us Jesus to redeem us. And he uses those hardships to draw us closer to himself. God is faithful in every circumstance that you can experience. There is no doubt in my mind. The question is, are you going to trust him? That's the question. You might be here today and you think, God, I don't even know who Jesus is. I don't even know if I'm going to heaven. I can tell you this. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It's not by your works that gets you into heaven, but by what he's done. Trusting that Jesus died on, your, on the cross for the payment of your sins. That will get you into heaven. Nothing else. Let me just tell you this. Not even reading this. You could read this and believe that Jesus didn't die for you. And guess what? You, mu you, you probably, you may spend some time, you go to hell. You know I mean? That's what the book says. Yeah, but I'm reading the Bible. Yeah, but you have you trusted my son? That's the question. What are you going to do with Jesus? That's the question, right? 